Hi, this is Matt at LSAT Lab, and today's lesson is on in-out grouping games in the logic game section. In-out grouping games are a really important game type. They make up 9% of all logic games. And while it's not the biggest game type out there, it's an important one in that it sits at that intersection between medium and hard. It's something that's going to take a little bit of effort to work on, and some people struggle with the um, uh, lack of concreteness that sometimes you might find in the game board. In today's lesson, we're going to look at the following. We're going to start with an example game so you get a chance to see what this game type looks like. And then we're going to talk about some of the characteristics that are associated with in-out grouping games, like closed versus open, so whether you know how many players go to each team or not, whether there are different kinds of players or subgroups, and then what are the opportunities for creating frames to allow you to move faster. So let's start with this example game. What I'd like you to do is try this one first. And what I mean by try this one first, Come up with a good game board, one that would allow you to create hypotheticals so that you can test cases, whether things could be true or must be true, or counterexamples, whether they don't have to be true, in order to help you navigate the answer choices. Then notate the rules next to the game board and make any inferences that fall into place from those rules. Take a few minutes to try this on your own, hit pause, and then when you're ready to check your work against mine, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So the first thing we need to do is create a good game board, one where we can create hypotheticals to test cases um, to check whether things could be true or must be true along the way. So now the game board here for in-out grouping games is essentially the same game board we're going to use for standard grouping games, which is a column chart. Um, in this case, with in-out grouping, we're only going to have two columns, one for in and one for out. So it says that we're going to select at least one of the following six types of stone. So that, that word select is your, is your clue that we're looking at a game of selection or in-out grouping is another way of referring to it. We can either do in and out. We can do selected, not selected. It doesn't exactly matter. What's most important is that in in-out grouping games, we understand that this is a binary choice. It's not like we have team one and team two. It, it's that we have team one and not team one. We have on stage or not on stage. The light is on or the light is not on. When we have the, op the logical opposite is our choices, that's a good clue that we're looking at a, a game of selection or in-out grouping game. So we're going to have a selected versus not selected, and then here's our cast of characters, L, M, N, O, P, and T. We write them down next to the game board, and that's it for a good game board. We just need to play, have a place to put our players to create hypotheticals. It's relatively straightforward for in-out grouping. The next step is to notate the rules. And with in-out grouping games, we're looking at a lot of if-then rules. So, so we should expect to work with if-then rules when we're working on in-out grouping games. If we're not comfortable with if-then rules, maybe we want to consider whether we do the in-out grouping game first or later. Right? We might need a little extra time as we, as we struggle with the rules. So to notate the rules, we're just going to use the, the language cues that create if-then rules in order to organize them into if-then relationships. In the first rule, the word unless is the organizing word. It introduces a necessary condition. It also implies the negation of the sufficient condition. So it's a little bit trickier of a rule. This is probably the most complicated rule that we have to deal with here. But in terms of putting into notation, essentially, we're going to put n on the right side of the arrow, and we're going to negate m and o are selected. Well, what's the opposite of them both being selected? Well, if either one of them is not selected, then it's not the case that they're both selected. So if either M is not selected or O is not selected, then N is not selected, according to the first rule. The second rule, T is selected only if O is not selected. Only if is the language cue that tells us what introduces our, in this case, necessary condition. Right. Only if introduces a necessary condition, the term that goes on the right side of the arrow. Right. So we know that O is not selected, goes on the right, and T is selected, goes on the left, for the rule term number two. Rule number three is the same, it's just with L and P. So if L is selected, then P is not selected, and only if is organizing that relationship. And then finally, in the last rule, if is organizing the if-then relationship. If is introducing our sufficient condition, which tells us to put N on the left side of the arrow and L on the right side of the arrow. So that's it for the rules. Next step, make inferences. 
On in outgrouping games, inferences generally consist of connecting the if then relationships. So just like in a tree ordering game, where we'd take the relative relationships and put them together and to build the tree. In an in outgrouping game, we want to as much as possible connect the rules together using the common terms across the different rules. So you might look for you might just take the first rule and just put it down somewhere. Like if M is not selected or O is not selected, then N is selected. When we're trying to represent this in kind of a, a bigger visual map, we're going to go ahead and create spaces for M and O independently. M, if either M is not selected or O is not selected, then N is. We'll have spots for M and O separately. If we look at the next rule, T to O, it does connect on the front end of the first rule. So we can go ahead and just tack that on to the front of the first rule. If we look at the next rule, L and P, there's no common term between either L or P and anything that's already connected together. So let's pass over the third rule for just a second. Look at the fourth rule. There, N is the common term. And so if N implies that L is selected, then we can add that to the tree. And now that makes the third rule a little bit easier, if L then not P. And so we can connect all the rules together to lead to this one kind of masterful system. You can take the contrapositive if you want, right? So you can say that if P is selected, then L is not selected. And if L is not selected, then N is not selected. And if N is not selected, then M is and O is. And if O is selected, then T is not. You can write that out as a contrapositive if you'd like. Or you can keep it as it is here. You don't even need to connect all the rules together. Some people like to leave the rules separate. But if you can connect the rules together, I think you'll find that it's easier to make the implicit inferences um, or see the implicit connections across the rules. So now that we've connected the rules together, let's take a look at the questions. So we'll let you try these questions one at a time. Pause the recording, see if you can find an answer that you like, and then when you're ready to check your work, hit play again and compare notes. All right, welcome back. So this is a rules question. It's just asking for an acceptable selection of stones, one that satisfies all of the rules. Probably a good idea just to take the rules and apply them one at a time and knock out wrong answer choices. So if you look at the first rule, M and O are selected unless N is selected. So if either M is out or O is out, then N is supposed to be in, right? Well, neither of them are out in A. O is out in B, so N needs to be there, and it is. M is out in C, so N needs to be there, and it is. M and O, neither of them are out in D. O is out in E, so N should be there, but it's not. So that limits answer choice E. And we're just going to do this one rule at a time until only one answer choice remains. So if you look at the second rule, T is selected only if O is not. So that means that if T is in, then O is out. Anything that has both T and O, and that's answer choice C. The third rule tells us that L is selected only if P is not. So any answer choice that has L and P we can get rid of, and that's answer choice A. And then the last rule, N implies L. So if we ever see an N, we need to also see an L. We see an N in both B and D, but we don't see an L in D, so we can get rid of it. And that means that B is the right answer. All right, so here's question two. Go ahead and give this one a try on your own. And when you're ready to check your work, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So this is the second question in the set. It's a global question, meaning it's something we need to be able to answer without new information. And it's asking for a pair of stones of which at least one of them must be selected. So does it have to be the case that at least one of T and L is selected? Does it have to be the case that at least one of M and P is selected? Eventually, we're going to get to a pair where at least one of them has to be selected, and that'll be our answer. So if we look at answer choice A, T, and L, and we look at where they, how they uh, appear in the connected rules, there's a rule that says if T is selected, then O is not, and if O is not, then N is selected, and if N is selected, then L is selected. So the relationship between T and L is a rule that goes from positive to positive. Right, in order for the pair to be the right answer, we need this answer choice to move from negative to positive. So a negative to positive rule is going to say that if one is out, then the other one is in. By contrapositive, if the other one is out, then the first is in. A negative to positive rule will require that at least one of them is selected. And so really what we're looking for is a pair where we can identify those, those stones in the tree where a relationship is drawn between them that moves from negative 
to positive. From T to L in the answer choice A, that's from positive to positive, and it won't require that at least one of them is selected. So let's get rid of answer choice A. Answer choice B has M and P. Now, M and P, that's negative to negative. Again, we're looking from negative to positive. This doesn't quite create the same relationship that we're looking for, so let's get rid of B. Answer choice C says M and L. So if we're going to connect M and L, there we go from a negative to a positive. So this looks a little bit better. Hold on to answer choice C. Answer choice D connects O and P. So if O is not selected, then P is not selected. That's negative to negative. We're looking for negative to positive, so let's get rid of answer choice D. Answer choice E connects T and P. Now that's positive to negative if we look at the relationship between them. That says that at most one of them is selected, but it doesn't require that either one is selected. So we'll get rid of answer choice E. And that leaves us with answer choice C as the right answer. All right, here's the next question. Go ahead and try this one on your own. Hit pause. And when you're ready to check your work, hit play again. And we'll look at it together. All right, welcome back. So this is the third question in the set. And this one is a local question, meaning it gives us a new piece of information inside of the question stem that apparently has some implications. And we want to find those implications before you really look at the answer choice. So if L is not selected, we can put L out, and we look for what are the implications of that. Well, we can find L in the tree, but unfortunately it goes from L to not P. We don't know that L is in, we know that L is not in. So we're gonna be able to employ the contrapositive of the tree in order to make inferences. And so if L is not in, then we know that N is not in. And if N is not in by contrapositive, we know that M and O are in. And if O is in by contrapositive, we know that T is out. And so we're able to make a lot of inferences about every stone except for P. Right? At this point, we have M and O are in, L, N, and T are out. P can do anything it wants. So which one of the following must be true? Let's take a look. Answer choice A says that O is not selected. We know that O is selected, so we can get rid of it. it must be false. Answer choice B, N, and O are both selected. Well, no, N is not selected. So let's get rid of B. C says M and T are both selected. Well, M is selected, but T is not selected. So let's get rid of C. That most three stones are selected. I think this might be our answer because we've got M and O in and the possibility of one more with P. But because L, N, and T are all out, it's going to be really, it's going to be impossible to have more than three. So I think D is going to be our answer. Let's hold on to it and double check E. E says that at least three stones are selected. Well, no, we've got two. We don't really know that we're going to have to have P. We could have P, but we don't have to have P. And so we have a, at least two stones are selected. We could have a third. We have at most three. So answer choice D is the right answer. Here's the next question. Give this one a try on your own. Hit pause. And when you're ready to check your work, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So now this is another local question. And this one's telling us that if M is not selected, it wants to know what cannot be true. So if it could be true, we'd get rid of it. Right? But that means that there's going to be some implications of M not being selected. We want to follow all of those implications as far as it goes and then use that information in order to um, eliminate answer choices. So if M is not selected, what do we know? Well. If we look at the tree, if M is not selected, we can just follow this one forwards. We know that N is selected, which means that P is not selected. What don't we know about yet? T and O. Right? So which one of the following cannot be true? Anything about T and O could be true, except for well, it, the relationship between T and O is a positive to negative one. That means that we can't have both of them in. We could have one in, the other one in, or them both out. Right. So which one of the following cannot be true? It could, it could be true that T is selected. We can get rid of answer choice A. And it could be true that O is selected. We can get rid of answer choice B. C says that neither T nor O are selected. Well, could they both be out? Sure, they could both be out. They can't both be in, but they could both be out. So that's possible still. Get rid of C. Answer choice D, neither P nor O. Well, that's possible. If O, I mean, we can do anything. We, we already know that P is out. And we can do pretty much anything we want with O. So yeah, it's possible that neither P nor O are selected. Get rid of D. If we look at answer choice E, both T and P are selected. Well, 
T and P can't both be selected because the relationship between them is a positive to negative one, right? That's actually true under all circumstances. It cannot be the case that T and P are both selected regardless of what happens with them. So E does have to be true, and that's our answer. All right, here's the last question for this game. Hit pause and try this one on your own. And when you're ready to check your work, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So this is a min-max question, which are pretty common on in out grouping games. On these games, it's pretty common for them to say, okay, well, what's the minimum that could be in? What's the maximum that could be in? If they ask you for the maximum, try putting everybody in and see what happens. What ends up happening is that you end up breaking rules, and so then you have to figure out how to conform to those rules. The rules that break are the rules that are going to go from positive to negative when you're dealing with the maximum, right? Because the rules that prevent you from putting everybody in are positive to negative rules. Right? If we look at which rules are being broken right now by after putting everybody in, we know that T and O cannot both be in. Right? So we need to figure out how we're going to get rid of one of them. Let's get rid of T, for example. And then if we look at the other rules, we see that we're also still breaking the rule that says if L is selected, then P is not selected. We can't have both L and P, so we have to get rid of one of them as well. Well, if we get rid of the P, it doesn't seem like that's going to interact with any of the other rules. Right? We have to get rid of one of T and O. We have to get rid of one of L and P. And if we do that, we can find a hypothetical that satisfies all of the rules. Right? T is not in, so we don't have to worry about that. M and O are in, so we don't worry about them. N is in. So we better have L, and we do. L is in, so we better not have P, and we don't. Right? So this hypothetical satisfies all the rules. So apparently 4 is the max, and to twist C. We could look at this from another perspective. So something else that's pretty common would be at the very beginning of the game, when we're kind of taking stock of our inferences, and to notice that we have this rule that goes from positive to negative between T and O, and that we can't have them both in or both selected one of them is going to have to be out. And so we could put a placeholder on the outside. If we know that either T or O is out, we can go T slash O over there. This still allows us to put them both out, but at least one of them is for sure out. We'll do the same thing with L and P. Right? We can do another uh, placeholder for L and P in the outside. Now we've got at least two stones that have to be out. Now we can do the same thing when it comes to rules that move from negative to positive as well. Right? If we know that negative to positive means that at least one of them are in, right? then let's say, for example, between M and N, we know that at least one of them must be selected. So we could put a placeholder between M and N on the inside. Then we could use these placeholders in order to arrive at the same answer. Essentially, if we know that at least two of them are out, then we can tell that the maximum would be four that are in. So a couple of different ways we could approach a question like this, but C is the correct answer. So now let's look at some of the features that are common to in-out grouping games. And let's look at whether games are closed or open. Closed meaning we know exactly how many are in and how many are out. Open, like in the last game, where it could change from one question to the next. So suppose you have a scenario that says a manager will put on sale exactly four of seven products. Right? This is your standard closed scenario. We know that exactly four of the seven products are in. Our column chart is simply going to have four in and three out. Now we can add F, G, H, J, K, L, and O to the game board and we're ready to go. About 42% of in out grouping games are closed, meaning we know exactly how many are in and how many are out. So a large percentage of them, but not all of them, not even a majority of them, the majority of them are going to be open. 58% right? of in out games, uh, we won't know how many are in or how many are out. And that vagueness is one of the aspects of in-out grouping games that tends to bother people. It leads to a situation where you don't have a very concrete game board. Right? If you have the column chart without any of the slots, it can feel like the game board isn't very solid. So here we have a manager will put on sale at least one of seven products. Right? The key difference here is at least one of seven products, not exactly four. So when it's saying that there's gonna be at least a certain number, that's a good sign that we're looking at an open game. We've got our players, F, G, H, J, K, L, and O. And this game board is just a little bit less clear. We won't know how many are in and how many are out, but otherwise the game board will be identical. Next, let's look at subgroups. What happens when you have different kinds of players? This is going to be something that we'll see on about a third of in-out grouping games. So something that shows up fairly regularly, often in connection with the game being closed, 
right? It's really common for us to see open games where there aren't subgroups and closed games where there are subgroups. So those are natural pairings. So here we have a radio DJ. We'll select exactly four songs to play during her show. Exactly two will be pop songs, F, G, H, and J, and exactly two will be country songs, K, L, and M. So we're going to choose two of each of these different kinds of um, songs. Right? We have pop songs and country songs. So we'll, we know that we're going to be selecting. That's telling us in and out. that The radio DJ will select exactly four. So here it's closed. Exactly four songs. Right? It's closed. So we can put four in and three out. And then for our players, we're just going to list them separately. Right? We've got the pop songs and the country songs. We'll do this just like we do subgroups in ordering games. In this case, they tell us that we're going to have exactly two of each of the different kinds of subgroups. And so we can maybe keep track of that above, two for the pop and two for the country. That should help us um, make quicker um, deductions. So for example, one thing you can do in a situation like this is you can use the fact that the game is closed to your advantage. The, the closed nature of the game allows there to be fewer um, solutions. And because there are fewer solutions, we should get more control. We might be able to even do some upfront work. So for example, here, if we're going to have two country songs, and there are only three country songs to choose from, there's a limited number of ways in which we can make that happen. There's actually three ways in which you can grab two from three. Right? We can either grab K and L, K and M, or L and M. Right? And so that might be a way in which we can use the fact that this has got subgroups to our advantage to create some frames and maybe get a head start on, on the game. I would assume that with the other rules, we might be even able to fill in some of the other positions uh, in the game board. So that brings the discussion to the last topic in this lesson, which is about frames. And frames is something that gives you an opportunity to move more quickly through the questions because you do a, some work up front once, and then you leverage that work as you're answering all the questions. And so it allows you to move more quickly because you're essentially not repeating your work. So what are the triggers for creating frames on in-out grouping games? Well, all but one scenarios definitely count. And so what we just saw was an all but one scenario where we were asked to choose two out of the three of the country songs. So two of three is all but one. This would also work for three out of four as well. So here, if you're choosing two out of three, remember K, L, K, M, L, M, right? we might get a rule. We might even get a rule that says if K is selected, then M is selected. If you have two of the players connected in an if-then rule within one of the subgroups, that often allows you to make a further inference. So for example, if K implies M, right, then K and L is not an option as a pair of two that would satisfy the rules. We either are in a situation where we have K and M, or L and M. But either way, the inference is that M is definitely selected. So when you have a rule that goes from positive to positive, it's that right side of the arrow that ends up having to be true um, when you're choosing all but one. We could try another example. We could look at this from on the left side. And let's say we're choosing three out of four from the pop songs. If we were choosing three out of four, there's four ways of grabbing three from four. We can grab F, G, and H. We can grab F, G, and J. We can grab F, H, and J. Or G, H, and J. Right? Four different ways of grabbing three from four. Hopefully, we won't have to use all four of those. Hopefully, there's a rule that allows us to eliminate some of them really, really quickly and um, can help us narrow down the frames to maybe two or potentially three. So let's say we have a rule that says that if G is selected, then J is not. So it's going to go from positive to negative. In this case, any of those scenarios where G and J are both in, we can get rid of. Right? So we can get rid of the second and the fourth options. And that leaves in both of them F and H consistently there. Right? So if we're going to choose all but one, and we have a rule that goes from positive to negative relating two of those players within that all but one, then the others are the ones that have to be selected. Right? So in this situation, if G and J, we can't have them both, we're going to have to have F and H. And so there's an inference. And we can either run this out either with G or with J. And since you can't have both, if you have G in, that's going to imply that J is out. 
If you have J in, that implies that G is out. And so that gives us leverage on this game because we're now starting to make, we're starting to see how the game is limited into just a couple of different solutions. And this is pretty common on closed games with subgroups. Another opportunity for creating frames uh, on in-out grouping games is based off of rules with opposite triggers. So rules that have either K on the left side and not K on the left side. So basically, the left side of two different rules need to be the logical opposite of each other. If K is selected, then G is selected. And if K is not selected, then L is selected. Because we have two rules that begin with the opposite trigger, we know something no matter what. It's going to be the case that either K is selected or the K is not selected. And that gives us an opportunity for creating frames. We can run out one frame where K is and one where K is not. Follow the inferences that follow along from that. So if K is selected, then G also is selected. Whereas if K is not selected, then L is selected. So we can add those to the frames. Hopefully the other rules would allow us to make further inferences after we got started with this as the fork in the road. And so conditionals that begin with the opposite trigger are another good opportunity for creating forks in, in outgrouping games. Now you won't see that very often, but if you do, explore it. So in summary for in-out grouping games, the game board that we're going to use is a standard column chart. Right? We're going to have a, one column for the inside, one column for the outside. If we don't know how many players are in and out, we call it open. If we do know how many players are in and out, we call it closed. The kinds of rules we're going to use for in-out grouping games are fixed positions, where we know the player is just being assigned in or out. Um, a fixed relationship, where we know that you know, exactly one of these is going to be selected or a conditional relationship, and that's the one that we're going to expect to see the most. Most of the rules on in-out grouping games are if-then relationships. We need to be comfortable using those conditional language cues in order to set up the if-then notational form. Finally, for creating frames, we have a couple of strategies. Either look for situations where you're choosing all but one of a particular subgroup, or look for a couple of if-then rules that have opposite triggers. Either of those would work. So that's it for today's lesson on in-out grouping games. I invite you to check out these other lessons or visit us today at lsatlab.com.